with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. We thank you that you would choose to love us. Lord, even when we're stiff-necked in rebellion, you continue to be faithful and, and, and long-suffering for us, Father. We thank you that the humbleness that Jesus had when he came and humbled himself and became flesh and blood, the words that he has, has given us, Lord, that the words of life, Father, that he not only gave the words, but he lived a life of compassion, a life of love, a life set on mission for what the Father's will was. Because, Lord, it was your plan that you would crush your Son instead of crush us, Father, if we would just choose to believe. Fill us with your Spirit today, Lord. Help us to hear and be led by the Spirit. Write your words on our heart that we might not sin against you, Lord. And help us to love even the unlovable in this world, Father, because that's exactly who we are when we humbled ourselves and came to Jesus. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can you hear me? Okay. So how many of you are keeping up with your reading? Good job. I didn't expect hands, but that's okay. Did you find a discrepancy in this week's reading? Yeah. So I, I could get you guys if you're reading, because you should have caught this. February 6th. The scripture that you're supposed to read from 1 Thessalonians 2B13. What's 2B13? <laughs> yeah, it's a typo there. So I just went and read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 13. I don't know if that's what it was or not. Sherry, she has to sit there and figure out everything. Well, there's not a 13 in chapter 3, and there's not a thir <laughs> So it has to be, because what, what is 2B? To be or not to be? <laughs> So anyway, I just thought I would catch you guys on that and see if you were reading. That's the first time I've seen a typo in it like that. But anyway. Yeah, it's not the second. I use that a lot where I go in the part. There's not a real second part of two, but that still doesn't work because is it chapter one, chapter two? You didn't have the colon. and you don't know what to do. So as you're reading, remember that. I'm going to point that out today because we're going to read past this story about a leper a little bit. And of course, we're going to go back a little bit too. Luke wrote this gospel so that Theopolis, friend of God, might understand what he's been taught so that if you're taught it, you live it. Okay? You don't just take that education and put it aside and don't do anything with it. If you're taught to be a surgeon, then you practice surgery. If you're taught to become a fisher of men, then you apply God's word so that he'll make you into a fisher of men. You don't even have to do it yourself. Jesus does it as you submit to him. You are a new creation in Christ, and God will finish the wonderful work that he has started in you. You are God's masterpiece to do good works, which he planned before we knew time existed. So if you think about fishing, fishing for men, what kind of fish do you fish for? We normally choose what type of fish we fish for, right? Well, that's not true when you're talking about fishers of men, isn't it? Especially not true when you take this story of a leper. How deep are you willing to fish? Are you re willing to fish even for what fishermen would call the trash fish? Oh, wow, that we, I could even say that, but yet that is our mentality some because we look at others with judgmental, scornful eyes. And I want you to realize that because that's who the leper is. The leper is an object of sin. And so many times, and especially in biblical times, the sin, the, the 
problem that the person had, the disease or the befailment of disaster that came upon or whatever, even the, the disciples asked that, did, did, or Jesus asked them that, do you think the tower fell on those people because of what they did? And they lived in a society that, that was so much, had so much hatred and disgust for their brothers that they would even travel around the coast around Samaria rather than going through it because they didn't want to be around those half-breeds. And you can't tell me you don't have any of that in your mindset, in your life. It even falls in our families where you don't want to have anything to do with this person or that person because of the things they've done. And in this case, the leprosy was an outward sign of what sin had he done or what sin had his parents done, which is not necessarily the truth. Sin has consequences. God does what God does best, you know, what he deems best. But in this case, this man had leprosy. Why? We don't know. But we do know this. We do know that he was an outcast to society. He was a person that was worthless, had no value whatsoever as a human being. He was the walking dead, a picture of what sin looks like in our lives because sin leads to separation from family, friends, from all life that we know of, the good things of God, and it ends in death. Now I say all that first so that we can understand a little bit more of the Scripture. The account is found in Matthew and Mark also. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside. What mountainside? Let me think. I know my Bible. I see Matthew chapter ooh, 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. So that's the mountainside that, that um, Matthew's talking about. And as I study more and read more, I see that Matthew's is more in chronological order. So if I'm looking at a time thing, Jesus is at the height of his teaching, and his teaching is so outlandish, so out there, but so had so much authority and everything else that he could tell you that if you've had th lustful thoughts, you're guilty of adultery. And I've never really thought about that before because I thought of myself as better than these other people. I don't have leprosy or anything else. I'm a good, righteous person. But yet none are righteous, no, not one. And I've had those adulterous thoughts. So I'm guilty of adultery. So I'm contemplating this teacher that has grown to fame and everything that just expounded so much that my mind is blowing and then next thing that happens is I confront a leper. Again, I'm setting this up so I hope that you can get a picture of what's going on. When Jesus came from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came up and knelt before him. Wait a minute, why is this guy in the picture? I mean, it could have been any other person and it would have been somewhat acceptable. But this person coming up right now, this was the total opposite of what anybody would ever want to see coming into their life, this man. And he, said, and he knelt before Jesus. He, he laid out flat or prostate. Got it right? <laughs> he humbled himself before God and put him in a, to a, a position of servitude before his king, before his master. Had we seen this anywhere else in Scripture before in Luke? I'm questioning you to see if you can remember that. I don't remember it. And he said, Lord, on top of that. He said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Man, I could spend all sermon on that, what he said right there. He knew who God was. He knew that Jesus came from above. He knew that he was more than just a prophet. He came to him in faith and said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, let's go from not the eyes of the crowds, but the eyes of the leper. I am worthless. I am dying. I'm diseased. I can't be around anybody. I have no worth. I am too far gone to be saved. There are people out there in this world that feel that way. You may or may not have felt that way. And they need us to accept them rather than to look upon them with shunful eyes. So if you're looking at Jesus and the humbleness and the love and the compassion that he has, right here is the most compassionate that you'll probably see Jesus short of dying on the cross. 
because this man had no worth to anybody except Jesus. He didn't even have it for himself. And he said, Lord, if you're willing, I know that you can make me clean. Not that you can heal me, that you can cleanse me, which does bring healing, which does bring back restoration into the family, which brings so many things. I can live my life now, but how am I going to live my life? Am I going to live it for my own desires that I've missed out on and everything else? Or am I going to live it for my Lord, the one who gave me life and gave me life abundantly? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. Now notice, and you'll notice it as I read on, and I'll get into it a little more later. Jesus' touch, the healing didn't come. Jesus' healing came again when the words came. And Luke is setting up the authority that Jesus' words had. And we had the authority that Jesus' words had unlike the scribes and the Pharisees and everything else, because there's no hypocrisy in his life, and he explains Scripture as it truly means and digs in deep so that I know that God judges my heart's motives and my thoughts, not just my outward appearance and how I look clean. Immediately, though, when Jesus spoke, the man was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. In Mark's uh, account, we learn that Jesus was moved by compassion. That's what drove him to heal this man, to cleanse this man. In Mark 1, verse 39, So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began talking freely, spreading the, good, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Now, if you didn't notice that, Jesus was indignant. I don't know what your version says. That's NIV. But he was moved or driven by a compassion that he has. And I have to stop and think again. When you see someone like this, are you driven by compassion or are you driven by ooh? Because so many times you see that person on the side of the road and you say, ooh. I do. I can admit it. Can you? Am I driven by compassion to get past the ooh, to get by why they're there? Oh, it's they did this or they did that or it had to be something that their parents did or hey, karma gets you or whatever it is. And will you be moved by compassion because they're in a lowly state that they cannot necessarily help themselves out of and you want to be compassionate? Because the God of all comfort has comforted you. The God of all compassion has given you compassion. The God of all love has shown you love and grace and mercy and kindness. And His love and mercy and graciousness, graciousness and kindness is new every morning like the dew on the grass. How do you view other people? If you're fishing for men especially, are you trying to pick the ones you want to throw back or you don't even want to catch in the first place? Depending on the fish that you're fishing for, again, you use the proper tools, you use the proper bait. When the fishermen that we just read about earlier in Luke, they cast out nets. They got all kind of fish. And the fish that weren't pleasing, they didn't want, that weren't palatable, they threw back. But this isn't the case with fishers of men. We fish for the least of these and that's perfectly fine because that's exactly what Jesus did. He would touch a leper. This made Jesus unclean. He would call a tax collector coming up. And he would sit and preach to Pharisees about the kingdom of heaven even though their hearts were so hardened they didn't hear anything. Some of them did. 
So let's look at the, look at the scripture in Luke. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. He didn't just have leprosy. He was covered with leprosy. What does that mean? Well, Luke's a physician again. He's writing an orderly account. He writes details that we don't see anywhere else. And he's writing this gospel out so that you understand the things you've been taught so that you live for the King of kings and Lord of lords that you pattern yourself with the mindset of Jesus Christ, the compassion of Jesus Christ, that your life is not your own, that you humble it before your God, your God Almighty and you say, Thy will be done and Thy kingdom come. And you're fishing for men as Jesus turns you into a fisher of men. He was covered with leprosy. Leprosy in the Bible, and you, this is where you need to study words again, they can have different meanings, but in the Old Testament especially and in the New Testament too, leprosy was a catch-all for all skin diseases. It wasn't what we call leprosy per se now. And the most of, in all of leprosy made you unclean. That's why we talk about the law of Moses here. And you'd have to go back to Leviticus and read some of that. The, any skin disease made you unclean. Did you go back and read, if, you read, if you're reading along with me, because you know where I'm preaching from, did you read Leviticus chapter 13? And did you read Leviticus chapter 14? And all the things that had to be done when there was a cleansing of a skin disease. Now I emphasize that again. When there was healing, a cleansing. No one ever came back from covered with leprosy. Oh, you're thinking of Miriam, or you're thinking of, of uh, is it Naaman? I think it's Naaman. Naaman. Are, are you thinking of those? They had skin disease. They weren't covered with leprosy. Leprosy is a bacterial disease we know now. It's called Hansen's disease because that's the person who discovered more about it and the cure and so forth. It is treatable. It's not something you see in this country so much. Unless... Do you know how you get it in this country? <laughs> Mark does. Unless you've been handling armadillos. <laughs> armadillos carry the bacterium that can cause Hansen's disease. You do find it in other countries, and it is a flesh-eating disease, but that's not what it is. It's a nerve-damaging disease, which turns the body into a point where you have no control, you have no feeling, no touch, anything else. Man, if this man's a picture of sin, can you think about what hell's like? There's a, a story, description of it, talking about the days of hell, and when the person gets there at first, he's like, yeah, it's kind of dark and, and things, but I'm going to find my friends here, and blah, blah, on day two, the, some of his senses are gone by day three, he doesn't have any touch or feeling anymore. His eyes are, are not being controlled because of the darkness and everything. Day four, oh, the sounds that he thought he heard, he, they sound like moanings and groanings. Day five, there's utter darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. If this man is a picture of sin and this, this man's leprosy is a picture of that, then he's had leprosy for a long time because it's a slow-acting disease, and you probably don't even know you have it at first till you know that you have it because of the problems that you're having. And yes, there are skin lesions and things that will come up, but you've had it a while probably by that point, and you're cast out from society because they don't want to catch it and because you're ceremonially unclean again. So you have to go live with other lepers. You can't come back into the community or anything else. And as the disease progresses, it gets worse and worse till you have no feeling of anything. So you're sleeping in a leper camp at night and you have no feeling whatsoever and you roll over into the fire and your arm gets burned where you try to stay and you don't even know it because you don't have pain. Or because you're grouped together and there are boils and stuff on your flesh and I'm not trying to gross you out too much that in the middle of the night, rats come and eat one of your fingers off because they smell the flesh and they come and eat it. This is the picture of leprosy that this man had. It's not what Naaman had. It's not what Miriam had. And Miriam was sent outside the camp and had to go through the ritual and everything. This man was too far gone. Not to Jesus. Wow! And not only to Jesus, but that Jesus would touch 
this man and say, I'm willing. Wow. So, excuse me. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, when his eyes met the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Back to the wilderness, apart from from society, anything else, to be alone, to be tempted, but also to be with His Father in heaven, to spend a time in prayer, to be filled and empowered by the Spirit so that He would stay on mission because His mission meant that He would lay down His life for His friends. And what greater love is there than that, to lay down your life for your friends? Before this, remember in Luke's account, we had Peter's mother-in-law. That meant that others interceded for Peter's mother-in-law. I, I teased about Peter's mother-in-law and gave that joke, you know. But they loved their mother-in-law. They pleaded for her. They interceded for her. She was a good woman, but she had a fever. So they interceded for, their, for her. Would anyone ever intercede for this leper? We should if we have compassion. We should say, oh, right there, Jesus, here's a case that you desperately need to go because this, this is too far gone. Look what sin has done and everything. Do we realize who Jesus is at all? He didn't just come to perform party tricks. He came to set the captives free. Not to give sight to the blind so that they could see the things, the great things God has done in this world, but to see spiritual things that before Jesus came never were light. But Jesus came into the world as light to expose darkness. Jesus touched her, remember? Didn't just speak, but touched her. Jesus rebuked the fever and immediately the fever left. There were immediate healings Immediate demons being drove out by the word that came out of Jesus' mouth. And immediately, remember, she served. Then we read about many healings and exorcisms. But you didn't read about any lepers in that. But Jesus said, I can't stay with you. He became so popular in Capernaum. He said, I can't stay with you. I've got to go to the other towns and preach the good news of the kingdom of God which definitely meant repent for the kingdom is at hand and definitely would mean come follow me and forsake everything else and I will make you fishers of men. But are you willing to go deep to catch fish for the kingdom? Will you leave this world behind to follow Jesus? Or will you longingly look back to the gods that you used to serve? Will you, like Miriam... <laughs> Just let pride get in the way and say, aren't we leading these people also? <laughs> Shouldn't we get some recognition? Then you come to what my Bible had as the caption there, the leper's prayer. You know, I didn't really think about it until I saw that caption. That helped. I didn't think about it as a prayer, but it was a prayer. A prayer to God saying, you alone can save me. Maybe there is some worth for me. Maybe there is still some hope. And the only place I'm going to find hope is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's our message. It's where we came to find cleansing, to come to find healing. We just didn't think we were in as bad a state, but we were in just as bad a state. Because our sins meant that God would have to take His wrath out on us for all eternity. But instead, God loved us when we were His enemies and Christ died for us so that we could follow Him and be like Him in this world. <clears throat> it's 
studying, I love to go back and study the other scriptures as well. And I get back to Matthew's account again just to, to think about that. Now I'm thinking of the things that Jesus taught. And I'm going back to that point where not all who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. But we cast out demons in your name. Oh yeah, but I never did love a leper, did I? I always had judgmentalism in for those people. Do I under truly understand why Jesus gave up heaven and became flesh and blood and pursued the cross with a joy set before him? Or am I a respecter of persons? How do I live my life? If I read back in Mark's, I go back a little bit in chapter 1, verse 17, and I, I hear what Jesus calls out to the fishermen. And he says, Come, follow me. Dute o piso mu. Leave the world behind. Drop everything because you can't hold on to everything. So I'm going to the words in Hebrews and everything else. I run this race with perseverance. I get rid of everything like an athlete so that I can run well because I wouldn't want to carry this burden dragging behind me. I want to run towards the hope that I have of eternal salvation. And I'm running together with my family, those that I have fellowship with that have inherited the kingdom of God because they are like Christ in this world. And we give each other encouragement and run this waste well together. And of course I've got to get rid of the sin that is entangled. I have to live a holy, separate life. And Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. <laughs> what a relief because I thought this burden was on me, but now I know Jesus will do it in me whether I'm a leper or I'm whatever. Leviticus chapter 13, like I said, if you want to go back and study, talks about the skin diseases and the fact that you're unclean. Leviticus chapter 14 talks more about that and what they've got to do to, to uh, do the cleansing. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, These are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing. So I think about what all those things are and what they point to. When they are brought to the priest, the priest is to go outside the camp and examine them. If they have been healed of their defiling skin disease, the priest shall order that two live birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the person to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together from the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the defiling diseased and then pronounce them clean. And you can read on. But just right here I'm like, water and blood the blood of Jesus Christ and the water being flesh and blood and the, the baptism that we undergo that the Spirit does. And I'm just thinking all these things that symbolize and this leper didn't know any of this at this point. But he knew that Jesus was. He came to him in childlike faith. He knew that Jesus was who he proclaimed to be. The Son of God, the Most High, the Messiah, the Son of Man. And that if he was willing, he could cleanse this man. But what about me? From the standpoint, am I too far gone? And the standpoint of how do I still look at people that I think are too far gone? It was a disease where you were literally the walking dead not human anymore so therefore I don't need to have any compassion for you you're less than a man put yourself in the place of this man put yourself in the place of the people coming off the mountainside put yourself back in the place where you are in this country today in the position you're in 
and who you might can go to with the love of Jesus Christ instead of shunning them. Maybe you haven't shunned them per se, but you know they're being shunned and you just didn't take the time. It wasn't worth the effort. Whatever it is, whatever God is putting into your heart because he's called you to fish for men. Not to decide which type of fish you're fishing for or anything else, but to fish for men. And he will make you into fishers of men. So you have to have the compassion for the least of these. Because no one is too far gone for Jesus. No sin is too great. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and don't forget to humble yourself before your God and come to Him and ask Him to heal you of the pride you have, the prejudice you have, the sins that you have in your life that you know you still have. And He can cleanse you as well. When He saw Jesus, He fell with His face to the ground and begged Him. You know, the problem with people needing to be saved is they've got to realize the sin problem in their life. They've got to realize that they will face eternal death. You can't throw a life preserver to a man that doesn't know he's drowning. He will not use it. And there are people that realize they're drowning but still think they can save themselves. So when you throw the life preserver, they're still trying to save themselves instead of just holding on. You don't need to kick anymore. You don't need to do anything else anymore. You need to cling to the life preserver. But so many people still fight and kick and everything else. They're still in a panic mode or they still think they can take care of themselves. Hold on to the life preserver. Just sit there and relax. Because the life preserver's got you. That's what it's for. How much more is your heavenly Father going to save you and take care of you? Just realize that. And live a life of love. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Know that Jesus is who He says He is, that He is Lord of all, Lord of creation, Lord of everything, and He loves you so dearly. Leave the world behind and follow Him, fixing your eyes on Jesus. So He reaches out and touches. Jesus reached out His hand and touched the man. It's like I said before, made him unclean. Said he wasn't scared of the man. What it said to the man was, I am worth it. I am loved. I don't understand all this, but Jesus came from God. and He has the words of life, and he loves me. I wanted to be cleansed so that I could go back to society, so that I could live and so many Christians are that same way, but they don't understand what true life means. That Jesus came to give them life, to give them life abundantly. So I don't look for the things of this world anymore. I live for the things that Jesus lived for. And I pattern my life after Him, and I have to be dependent on prayer, and I have to have those group of, of men and women around me to help support me and everything else. But I have to know that I'm living for the King of kings and Lord of lords that my life is not my own and that I fish for all men. Has Jesus touched you? Then Jesus answered him and said, I am willing, be cleaned, and immediately the leprosy left him. Okay. You got the man's thoughts. I hope you're thinking about them, but let's go back to me, myself, and I. What am I still thinking that I struggle with in my life and say, Lord, I've tried so hard, but I can't get rid of this out of my life. Am I just letting the life preserver take care of the, the work again? Or am I still fighting? I continue to have problems with my anger or alcohol or addictions or whatever it is or just plain not loving other people. Let Jesus make you a new creation because you already are. You're already seated in the heavenly realms with Him. You are a child of God. Do you realize all this? The leper didn't realize all this. We're going to read on a little further and, and see that. He realized who Jesus was, but he still didn't realize following Jesus. Because here's what comes next. 
Then Jesus ordered him. It's a military order. As the king, you pledge allegiance. I do cleanse you. I want you to understand everything back with the law and everything else so that you can be accepted in society. Don't tell anyone. But instead, go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Oh, catch that, as a testimony to them. Your life is supposed to be a testimony. Go and be witnesses. It's not for you to know the hours or the seasons or anything else, but it is your job to be a witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and to be a witness here, there, and everywhere you go. But as you're reading this, you've got to figure, Why? Just like when you read the story of the, the legion of demons, why did Jesus leave him on the other side of the lake? To be a witness where he was. To be a witness where Jesus commanded him. He needed a witness to the priest. He needed the man to be accepted and cleansed the way the law said also not to go against it. But he needed more than anything for the man to be obedient. You say I'm who I am. You call me Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do. Maybe Jesus didn't want to just appear unclean. No. <laughs> Maybe we still need to follow the law. No. Jesus wanted the rest of the people to know the man was clean and would accept him. No. Jesus didn't want the testimony of this man. No. <laughs> These are all the things that we could think. Jesus was not ready to be exposed more yet. It wasn't his time. No. No one's going to kill Jesus before his time. Jesus wanted the man to experience what the ritual stood for. A little bit, sure. He might understand the cost, the death, the blood, atonement, adoption into the family. Well, he might experience those things. What about him just realizing he had been saved and set free on the bank? The life preserver drove him, drug him in and he's on the bank now. Those are all things that point to a reason, but the reason is, will you follow me? You've been cleansed. Your sins have been forgiven. Will you follow me? Because if we want to be honest, here's the problem within most churches and in Christianity. I've been saved, but can I live my life the same way? Can I pick and choose what you're king of? Can I keep making excuses and say I don't have this gift or ability or anything else? Or when this is time is done in my life, I'll truly follow you? That's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus taught. He commanded this man, and the man was disobedient after the saving grace he found. And the man didn't mean to be disobedient, I don't think. I think he was just so excited that he wasn't obedient. But your ways are not higher than God's ways. <laughs> your lack of patience doesn't mean that God's not going to answer your prayers or answer them even the way that you want to. An answer could be no. But he calls you to be his obedient servant. And if the law doesn't tell you that and doesn't tell you the consequences, then you don't understand your salvation again, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And here's the crazy thing. I don't know if Jesus knew it as a man at this point. He knew some things. But remember, he said, Scripture says that he emptied himself. So he didn't know everything that was going to happen as a man. And he didn't use his powers just to do what his will was. He was prayerfully obedient to God and led by the Spirit. Luke keeps putting this into that so that we see this. But if Jesus did know, which he probably knew based on knowing human nature at all, I don't need to, to know all things but to know that you're probably going to go back to your life or probably do what you want to do instead. And something this big, i got to tell of because it just makes sense. So Jesus probably knew that the man would disobey him, but yet he did it anyway. Wow. That means that when Jesus Christ laid down his life on the cross, he did it for every single human being that has ever lived and will ever live. Salvation is available to all. Are you telling the good news, the message? Yet the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. This man even cures leprosy to the point where Jesus is, I'll use the words, overwhelmed. But Jesus 
couldn't live the life he wanted to do. Well, not that he wanted to. Might have wanted to. He faced that again as, as our hum, a human nature. But he lived a life where he didn't have a place to lay his head because he was about his father's work. He drew, withdrew to lonely places, the wilderness, and he prayed, not my will be done, Father, but yours. If you can take this cup from me, then do it. But your will be done, not mine. Let me stay on focus of being obedient to you and the mission that you called me to do, to bring salvation to men and help these men that say they'll fish for men that'll come and follow after me, help give them the power and the thought to do that. Keep the evil one from them. Bind the powers of demons in their life and everything else because they have no authority and no power in their life. Help them to fix their eyes on me. Help them to ask to have their faith increased so that they can live a life of worth. Help them not to pick and choose what fish they want to fish for and think some that aren't worth catching. Fishers of men, what does that mean to you? Are you letting Jesus turn you into one? Do you have a fishing partner? Should. I'm talking about besides Jesus. I'm talking about in this world. Do you, if you're a Paul, do you have a Timothy? If you're a Barnabas, do you have a Paul? Whatever it might be. Are you writing the laws of God on your heart and telling your children about them and writing them on the doorpost of your house and, and praying for them constantly? Are you asking for your faith to be increased? Are you asking God to bring compassion into your life so that you can be compassionate to others? Verse 17. And I'm not going to dig into this deep, but remember, there's no chapters, no verses. Luke is writing this. That's why I said this again. One day Jesus was teaching, so this goes with this story. And Pharisees, that's the first time Luke has mentioned Pharisees. Not the first time Jesus has encountered Pharisees, because the Sermon on the Mount is into Jesus' ministry. His, his fame, so to speak, is spread. He, he can't have a minute's time to his own. And here one day, Pharisees show up. They've already decided that Jesus is in conflict with them, even though the miracles that they've seen, and again, this is labeling them all. We know that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he knew that Jesus was a man of God, but he didn't want to come to him in light because he didn't want his sins to be exposed. Scripture tells us that. Pharisee literally means set apart. Oh, that's what sanctification means, basically. But they set apart themselves as religious zealots and hypocrites writing into the law ways that you couldn't keep the law anymore so that you didn't think you had worth and so that I thought I had more worth than what I actually have because I am righteous. Boy, be careful where you're standing there. They're setting themselves apart. Their name was for the right reason again, but they went totally the wrong way and became the blind leading the blind to destruction blind guides because they couldn't see what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. They couldn't see the depth of the law to point to God's love and then the love that you could have by knowing God's love for you. One day when Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. So we've got the story, we've got the Sermon on the Mount, we've got the healing and the, the, the large catch of fish as we're studying, and we've got this leper, and I'm still digesting it and everything. Oh, yeah, so that I'm not sitting here like a Pharisee, am I? They were all sitting around Jesus, kind of like the woman when the Pharisees were sitting, and she came and sat at Jesus' feet and burst out into tears because she'd come in the presence of God and didn't, just didn't worry about things done. She worried about honoring and worshiping Jesus when yet Nicodemus just sat there and said I'm comfortable where I'm sitting with Jesus in the room with me we're in the same kind of situation here and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick 
Now that sounds strange, but Luke again is showing where the power comes from. He's a doctor. He's talking about where the healing comes from. Jesus was a man, and the healing comes from God, and we know that Jesus is from God because we see the hand of God working miracles. So the power of the Lord was, was Jesus to heal the sick. And some men, verse 18, if you read Mark, you'll know that it was four men, came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house. Okay, they're back in Capernaum. Maybe they're at Peter's house. Maybe they're at a bigger house. We don't know. But what we can gather from this is Jesus was teaching in the house, and there were people in the house, but the Pharisees had come and got the best seats again. Oh, we can go to Scripture and talk about that. And they blocked, they were in the room, and they blocked the room for people to get to Jesus. And there were people still bringing to people to Jesus because they had compassion. Four guys carrying a guy that can't move. Dead weight. That's not easy. Don't know where they had to go. And they get to the crowd, and they get to where the Pharisees are, and the Pharisees should have been the ones that said, Get out of the way and let them bring this man to Jesus. We've heard all the teachings and we know the healings. We know that Jesus can heal him. We know that Jesus is even willing. Remember that leper? I'd have never touched that guy. I've still got this in my heart. But at least I could have compassion for this guy. But they don't move. So the guys have to take him up to the roof. Tear the roof apart and drop him at the feet of Jesus to be healed. That's fishing deep, guys. I mean, come on. First of all, I had to have the compassion to do this. I had to get some buddies to fish with me, right? This is where this story is going. We had to go out together and fish for men because we wanted this man to be healed. We don't know who he was, what he deserved, anything else. He's not untouchable. He's not a leper. We didn't bring a leper to Jesus. We brought a man that was paralyzed. We brought him to Jesus because we got a little, little prick of compassion in our lives and we're working together to get it done. But now we get there and the religious zealots are blocking the way. What do we do? Turn around and go home? No, we carry this dude up on the roof and rip the tiles off the roof and set him down. We don't worry about getting arrested for destroying the house or anything else. Our mission is to bring this man to Jesus so he can be healed. Wow. Wow. Do you understand if you bring people to Jesus, you cannot just have them healed, but you can have them cleansed for all eternity? Man, that should change everything. So are you willing? Are you fishing? Do you have partners? Have you fixed your eyes on Jesus? Do you have compassion? What about for the least of these? What about for those who are really unclean? It's your job to bring them to Jesus. To come and follow Jesus wherever the Spirit leads you, even into desolate, lonely places where there's no way that you can face this world except by prayer, by empowerment, by the Holy Spirit, and to know that Jesus is right there with you. That there's nothing that He went through, that, that you go, have gone through, that He didn't go through and more. So maybe you can even get to the point where you keep your tongue quiet and you can go silent before your accusers. I'm not near there. <laughs> I struggle with the compassion, but I still struggle with not, not trying to justify myself with my wicked tongue. Do you understand what Luke is writing to you? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the words and the life of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. That He would give up heaven and become flesh and blood. That He would not have the comforts of this world that we have because of His love for us and His obedience to you. Oh Lord, we thank you and praise you for this salvation that we have. This wondrous, amazing grace. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear what Jesus Christ has done for us so that we will show that love to others. Not begrudgingly, not out of duty, but because we love as Christ loved us. Bind us together, Lord, with your spirit. 
Help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Help us to be the church that you have called us to, to do where we get to the point where we don't consider things our own, but we consider the things that you've given us, your grace to be gracious with others. Thank you for our freedoms that we have. Help us to be, take advantage of the freedoms that we have now to spread the gospel message. And Lord, we also pray for open hearts of those that we come to, Lord. Cleanse us, Father, so that we can be your obedient, humble servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.